Ah! The sweet smell of success versus the rancid odor of excess. And is there indeed a difference? I don't know. Let's find out. Hopefully we can explore that hot topic and many others on today's History Lesson Part 2 brought to you from me, Malcolm Tent, current bass player and member of the Administrative Propaganda Committee of the Almighty Anti-Scene. Doing this every fri uh, Friday. See, in, this, in these weird days, I don't even know what day of the week it is. I guess it's Sunday. Since I'm here live, it must be Sunday. So in following the tradition of the unimpeachable president for life, Jeff Clayton, I'm doing my own series of live broadcasts here on the Anti-Scene page, talking about the history of the band as I see it and I experienced it. Um, I've known the group almost since day one, been involved with them in any number of enterprises ever since then, and um, found myself as their bass player now. Go figure. So, yeah, once a week I'm going to sit down and cover a certain era of the band and what my perspective and involvement was with it. And uh, last week I covered the years from 1984 to 1990 when I, I very first met the band in 1984, all the way up until the year 1990, when I had the first anti-scene release on my record label, which is TPOS. The first record I released by them was the WXCI live radio broadcast. And that's where, we're, where the story picks up. If you want to see the uh, last week's story it's definitely posted on the anti-scene page where you are now i'm also uh i got it posted on my personal page if you want to head on over there you can see it there it's archived on the internet it's it's everywhere so no need to go into a, an excessive exhaustive recap on what i talked about last week <coughs> excuse me i just want to reach over to my uh monitor here because i'm streaming through my telephone onto my standalone computer i want to see if i can get this live stream to where I can watch it on the anti scene page and see everybody's comments and everybody's reactions and uh, questions or whatnot. So hang in there for just one second. I'm going to see if this thing is working. And we do have people talking. And people are reacting. And I promise I'm not going to do this anymore. Once I get established here on my computer, I'm going to devote all of my attention to you. So just hang on for one brief second. And I'm going to check and make sure it's still working. Uh, the, my phone says it's not connected. Is this thing connected or what? What's going on here? All right, apparently there was a glitch of some sort, and apparently I've got it worked out. So, theoretically, I'm on live, and I can actually talk to you guys now, and we can get this thing done. Am I right? Am I right? <clears throat> All right, enough bullshit. Let's get on with it, shall we? Okay, we've ascertained that we're here in the, night, in the year 1990. And even though I can't monitor to you guys anymore, I'm here. Um, before I go on any further, I should definitely set the stage a little bit, because the 90s were a really, really exciting time. There was a lot going on musically um, in the early 90s. It was probably the only time that music was the thing to do. Music was just where it's at. Um, for the, for one of the very few times in history, except maybe the 1960s when the garage band was, um, ascendant, the cool thing was to either be in a band or go see your friend's bands or release a record by your friend's bands, go on tour, print a zine. I mean, being in a band was the bomb in the early nineties. And 
since I was on the ground at the time with my record label and with my record store, I think I can say with accuracy that the whole thing was driven from Seattle. Really, whether anybody likes alt rock or grunge rock or not, the fact is is that what was happening in Seattle starting in the late 90s, uh, late 80s, really drove the whole thing. And I'm talking about pre-Nirvana, too. This is before Nirvana even popped their heads out of the woodwork. You know, the whole thing started off with, like, Mud Honey. Mud Honey was crucial. The Melvins. Melvins were key. Uh, even Soundgarden. Uh, beat Happening. Bands like that. There was a lot of really cool stuff coming out of Seattle starting around 1988-89. And it totally, of course, came to a head with Nirvana in 90 and especially 91. So... All of a sudden, the thing to do is to be in a band. The thing to do is to play shows. The social scene hung around going to see bands and playing shows and supporting bands and supporting shows. So this is really crucial because for the first time since the garage band era of the 60s, you've got a whole sweeping, wide-ranging support system for music and not just corporate bullshit drivel top 40 music our music from the underground you know real music real music made by we the people coming from the the, the grassroots truly from the, the street level from the, the alleys and whatever you want it was us making this music you know sub pop at that time was an independent label Sure, they had backing, sure, they had sponsorship or whatever, but they weren't plugged into the corporate structure. They were just a bunch of dudes putting out records by bands that they liked. And it took off. The zeitgeist was completely correct. It was the right time, the right place, the right thing. And damn, you've got all of a sudden a huge music scene where for this brief shining moment, it's really easy to be in a band. And that is where anti-scene comes in as it relates to our story today because it was right around that time that anti-scene began touring because they had Tom O'Keefe as their bass player and as Jeff Clayton mentioned in his history lesson on Friday Tom O'Keefe was the kind of guy who would pick up the phone and start calling he'd call clubs he'd call booking agents he was the guy who would sit down behind a desk and put in the elbow work for booking a tour, which led him into a very nice career as road manager and agent. Um, you know, he's done very well for himself, and he started with the almighty anti-scene. There he is right there. Yes, Ween's main man. Uh, sorry, Weezer. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Weezer's main man right there, starting out from this humble beginning. And all of that was possible because of the atmosphere that we're talking about, where rock and roll, and specifically alt-rock and grunge rock, were king and queen. And whether you like alternative rock or not, whether you like grunge or not, the old aphorism is true. A rising tide lifts all boats. So when Mudhoney and Soundgarden and Nirvana went out there and started touring, everybody came along with it. So Anti-Scene has started touring, and they're doing it in earnest. And I was looking at my old uh, tape trade list here of all Anti-Scene stuff I have. I'm looking at the era in question from the early 90s, and I'm looking at all the various shows that were recorded at various tours that Anti-Scene took part in in this time period. I mean, you can see they went up and down the East Coast in 91. They went to Europe in the summer of 92. They came back to the Northeast in the autumn of 92. They were back in Europe again in 93. They were doing the Southeast in late 93. And, um, you know, they played the West Coast around there. This was all happening. This is all possible because of the ascendancy of alt-rock, grunge rock, etc., 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 what was also really easy to do was to put out records. Uh -huh, yes, it was very easy to put out records at this time because everybody was buying records. Bands were putting out records. Guys like myself were putting out records. 
and via my record store in Danbury, Connecticut, Trash American Style, we were selling records. And I gotta tell you one thing, people, this is the truth. I'm gonna take a swig of water here. I love this fluoridated Danbury water. Get my whistle wet. I've been a full-time professional record seller, record dealer, record label guy, whatever you want, since 1986. The early 90s was the only time in this business I ever only time in this business that I ever made money. Like, you know, obviously I make money, you know, I make a living off of this, but I'm talking about making money, Jack. That only ever happened in the early 90s. I mean, Whew, I get wistful just thinking about it. And anybody who was there knows how exciting it really was. Coast to coast, north, south, east, west. All the bands, all the music that was happening. And Anti-Scene was able to take advantage of this fully. I was making money. And making money meant I was able to do what I love doing best, which is put out records. And that coincided very neatly with Jeff Clayton's desire to put out records. In my experience, I think that Jeff Clayton is at least as fiendish about releasing records as I am. And I think that's one reason why we get along so well. <laughs> we love releasing records. So, Clayton and, I, Clayton and I were in regular contact since 1984 when I first saw Anti-Scene and had my brain blowed into shards of shrapnel by their brand of Destructo Rock. And I'd gone to see them any number of times I possibly could. Um, the st statistic was I saw the band, I saw anti C 19 times over the years before I became a member. Um, friends with the guys, always talking. So one day, Jeff Clayton gives me a call at Trash American Style and says, Hey man, my brother's got a project band and they recorded some stuff. You want to release it? I said, yeah. I mean, no hesitation whatsoever. Yeah, I want to release it. It's 19... Let's get the year right here. It's mid-1991. Alt-rock, grunge rock is really taken off. And all of us are hanging along for the ride and making hay while the sun shines. So he, uh, I'm like, what is it? He says it's a band called Rawhead. And they want to release a record. Voila! Rawhead. Featuring future anti-scene drummer... Greg Clayton, and a couple of other dudes doing what was, at the time, I'm pretty sure this was the very first G.G. Allen tribute record. And it really wasn't a tribute record because G.G. was still very much alive. But he had been jailed. He was in jail for the first time. So this was very much an effort to support G.G. and keep his name out there and keep his music out there and get the message out. Free Gigi. So that's kind of a bit of a groundbreaker, I think. <clears throat> the efforts of Greg Clayton, facilitated by Jeff Clayton and his cohorts. This is a pretty cool record. It even has a... You can't really see it from here, I don't think, but it's got a note from Gigi himself written from prison. Um, I'll read it to you. Note from Gigi Allen. I am now in prison because of who I am and what I stand for. But we must continue to spread the disease. We must... God, his handwriting was terrible. Ah, we must build more access for the mission. This band has dedicated this record to the cause. Signed, G.G. Allen. 1991, kids. This record came out in June of 1991. And there's Greg Clayton himself letting the colors fly. And so this was the first of a, a flurry of releases that were related to anti-scene that I was able to do in full cahoots with them in the early 90s because the time was right. It was totally possible to take a, a one-off recording project like Rawhead, press 500 copies, and sell them because the market was there. And that's all we made. We made 500 of these. I, don't, I know Rawhead never toured. I doubt that they ever played live, but they, they did a record. It's here, and they paid tribute to the man himself. And this is a really neat part of G.G. Of, uh, G. G. Allen and anti-scene history and lore. Because while anti-scene were out touring literally all over the world, they had the side projects going to keep the, stoke, the, the home fire stoked while they were out on the road. And just a, a bit of a note, 
regarding what this little sticker is, if you guys can see it. And I'm going to call a brief timeout because on my computer, I can't monitor anything. It's not letting me see the live stream. So I have to go look at the phone for one second to make sure I'm still on here. and I'm not just talking to a dead phone. Hang on one second. I'm still there. What a lovely feeling. Okay. The, the fun of releasing records is to make special editions. Usually it's colored vinyl or maybe a limited sleeve or something like that. For a one-time pressing of 500, I couldn't afford to do colored vinyl, even with the great revenue stream that there was from Alternative Rock. Colored vinyl was pretty expensive. But I did make, I hope you guys can see this, a first day of issue cover. Now, a little well-known fact, or I should say a well little-known fact about Malcolm Tent is that besides being a fanatical record collector, I'm also a big-time coin collector and a bit of a stamp collector as well. So anybody out there who's a philatelist and collects stamps knows what a first day of issue cover is. What I did was I made a stamp, it says first day of issue, stuck it to the cover, postmarked it with a TPOS stamp, if you can see it, cancellation, and uh, let that be the limited edition version of the Rawhead record. I think I made 20 or 30 of those. Not too sure about that. So Greg Clayton, if you're out there, Rawhead reunion time. It's got to happen. And I've got a, a brother band for it called Bloody Bones. I think we should do it. Split 7-inch. The time is right. All right. June of 91. Now let's see where Anti-Scene was in June of 91. June of 91, they were just about to kick off another Northeastern tour because I see they played New Haven, Connecticut in 91 at the Rock Bar. Oh, no, actually, it was a place... Here's an interesting thing. Anti-Scene played a place called The Moon in New Haven, Connecticut in July of 91 with my band called The Bunny Brains. And it was a wild-ass show. Anti-Scene wasn't doing the complete and utter destructo rock anymore. There were no more smoke bombs. There wasn't too much smashing anymore. Not really much in the way of bloody mannequin heads. But there definitely was blood. There definitely was a huge anti-scene banner behind the stage, which looked good. Not many bands did that. And there was just the attack, man. The anti-scene attack. And the lineup was, of course, Jeff Clayton, Joe Young, Tom O'Keefe, and I'm pretty sure that yeah, Steve Sadler was in the band at this point. Doug Throgmorton was out. Steve Sadler was in. So you've got Clayton, Young, O'Keefe, and Sadler bringing their version of Destructo Rock to a venue called The Moon in New Haven in July of 91. Six weeks later, Nirvana played The Moon in New Haven. And I think that's really important because that shows you that Anti-Scene and Nirvana, at least for a very short period of time, were on the same circuit. They were playing the same clubs. They were making the same rounds. They were touring the same route. And it really makes you wonder, you know? I mean, what if Anti-Scene ended up getting that sort of corporate management? I mean, I, I, I tend to think that they wouldn't have gone that route anyway. I, I, I can't really even imagine that. But it's a what if, you know? It's just one of those historical what ifs. What if, you know? What if Sub Pop had released more than one record by Anti-Scene and decided to take that ball and run with it. It's quite a thought, isn't it? Really interesting. But that just goes to show you how interesting things were in the early 90s, you know? You didn't have necessarily Anti-Scene and Nirvana and Soundgarden and Mudhoney, you know, all playing together at the same time, but they were in the soup at the same time, at the same place, doing more or less the same thing. And when Anti-Scene played at the Moon in New Haven, in July of 91, it was, a, it was a wild show. It was totally nuts. Um, lots of booze, lots of debauchery, um, all night hanging out. They killed it. My band, the Bunny Brains, killed it. We all got along fine. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, Todd Goss was the sound man. And I need to give a special prop out to Todd Goss, who is still involved in the band actively to this day. Todd Goss was the touring sound man with Anti-Scene. And the dude was right on the money. You knew that whenever you went to go see Anti-Scene at that time period with Todd Goss behind the board, it was going to sound good. Todd really knew what he was doing. 
And that also shows you just what things were possible in the early 90s because there was enough of a, a market and enough support for bands like Anti-Scene to go out on tour and they could bring a sound man or, or a merch guy or a roadie. It was possible to support this kind of infrastructure. Um, we still do it this way, that way to this very day. But back then, that was still a little bit unusual. Not every band did that. Anti-Scene always did that. Anti-Scene always had that level of professionalism and can-do attitude, which always impressed me, you know, as, as a fan and observer. Always blew me away when they, we would come to town. It was a complete package. Really liked that. So that's what it was like in 91, 92, 93. They were able to do that, and that's who they were hobnobbing with, and that's who we were going to see, this entire class of bands. So the Rawhead record's being released, Anti-Scene's on the road. It's the early 90s. Things are happening. They come back. I get a phone call one day from Jeff Clayton. There I am at the Trash American Style, a.k.a. TPOS headquarters, a.k.a. the greatest record store that ever existed in the history of mankind. In the early 90s, when it was very exciting, when I needed a staff of eight employees two of whom did nothing but open up CD and cassette cases. I mean, it was like that in the 90s. It was nuts. Jeff Clayton calls me up one day and says, Man, I've got a tape. And I really want to press it on vinyl. But it's really bad. It's supposed to be bad. This could be the worst record ever made. Are you game? I said, Yeah, man. Tell me more. And he gave me the whole spiel, <clears throat> and I'm sure he'll, he might end up talking about this at some point, about a one-off band. <laughs> Notice I had to choose my words very carefully with that one. This one-off band in the incredibly intense genre of sheet metal. That's right, the world-famous and foremost practitioners of sheet metal. And the gig that they played at the Yellow Rose in Charlotte in 1984 on their infamous Bitches Die tour. I'm talking about Jeff Leopard. God damn, Jeff Leopard. It happened. It happened. They played a show. They did a cassette release of it. I don't know how many they made, but the number was minuscule. I've only ever seen one in person, and it's in the collection of Michael Pilmer, another long-time anti-scene fellow traveler, the guy who administrates and runs their website, antiscene.com, which you should visit as often as possible for late-breaking developments in the exciting world of anti-scene. You should see a picture of the current lineup with me in it. That's incentive right there, isn't it? It is. God damn it, don't you forget it. But I digress. Antiscene.com by Michael Pilmer, who actually owns an original Jeff Leopard cassette. That's bragging rights, people. That's the real deal. So any Jeff Clayton says, you know, let's press this thing on uh, vinyl. I was like, sure. It's 1992 at this point, and the time is right to do wild and crazy projects like this. We're going to release the worst record ever. And uh, even in those exciting times, I thought that the market could bear about maybe 300 copies. So, boom. It was said. It was done. 300 copies pressed of the Jeff Leopard record. And just a little note of the graphics on the Jeff Leopard and the Rawhead and a couple other records I'm going to talk about. Um, the graphics are all done by Jeff Clayton. He put all these together using cut-and-paste techniques using rub-on letters. If anybody remembers rub-on letters, you can still find them. They look like this, actually. You've got this big sheet of plastic letters that you rub with a blunt object, and the, the letter adheres to the paper. So this was done with these, painstakingly, one letter at a time, with a pencil and a sheet of paper by Jeff Clayton. By that, I'm sorry, Jeff Leopard, my mistake. That's the way it was done, man. Everything was cut out with scissors and drawn with pen and ink and rubbed on 
with letters. Man, it was a pain to put out a record back then. But when the product was something as cool as Rawhead or Jeff Leppard, very well worth it. Very, very, very well worth it. So we pressed 300 copies of the Jeff Leppard record. And even in those days, there really weren't that many people who wanted to buy the worst record ever. So at one point, I got really tired of looking at unsold Jeff Leppard records. And I threw down the gauntlet. I issued an ultimatum. I placed an ad in Maximum Rock and Roll, which I talked about at length in my last broadcast, and which Jeff talked about in his last broadcast, saying, if y'all don't buy any of these Jeff Leppard records, I'm going to destroy all unsold copies as of March 1st, 1996, I believe. So you better buy them now, because they're going to cease to exist. I will be at war with all unsold copies after March 1st, 1986. So buy them now. And sure enough, people bought a whole bunch of them. I, sales were pretty good. People were buying like two or three of them. But I was still left with a, a pretty fair number of unsold copies. I think, see, I wasn't keeping track of things back then the way I do now. I think I had about a hundred or sold or so unsold copies. I'm ballparking it. So um, late one night at um, the back room of Trash American Style, I got to work with my hammer and my screwdriver and my chisel and my claws and started destroying Jeff Leopard records. And uh, for a while then, anybody who would write me and say, hey, you got any more of those Jeff Leopard records? If they'd missed the deadline, I'd say no. But I do have pieces. If you would like a shard of a Jeff Leopard record, I'll be very happy to mail you one. If you'd like some confetti made from the Jeff Leopard sleeve, I got as much as you want. I got boxes of this stuff. I was using it for packing material for a while. You know, you could have mail ordered something from TPOS and got something like this to pad the box with. I tried, tried making guitar picks out of Jeff Leopard records, but they're 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 too brittle. They're too fragile. You can't really play guitar with them, but you can smash them. They're a lot of fun to smash. Oh, resilient, this one. There we go. So yeah, Jeff Leopard. Thus is the fate of unsold Jeff Leopard records. Now the savage irony. Wow, look at that one. How's that for a shape? A study in shape and contour. The irony, the final irony about the Jeff Leopard records, which I will tell you about in a second after I have this little swig here. And I'm also going to duck over here just for a second to comment, uh, see what the comments are looking like on the video. Um, okay, it's coming through. That's good. The irony is that I actually sent a little, uh, a couple of Jeff Leopard, re re help me. I sent a couple of Jeff Leopard records out for distribution. That's how alive the music business was at the time. There were distributors who would actually take a chance on the worst record ever pressed. Um, they apparently didn't sell too many either because after I had the smashing party of unsold Jeff Leopard records, like months, months later, I got a box of returned merchandise from a distributor who you know just had some unsold stuff left. And lo and behold, there were about... 10 copies of the Jeff Leopard record in there. So I was kind of on the horns of a dilemma. It's like, well, do I smash these? Or, or not? I mean, it's really not fair because people didn't have a chance to even buy these because they were stuck on a shelf somewhere in New York. What do I do? What I did was I probably forgot about them and stuck them in another box and put that box somewhere and didn't find them until years later. So to this day, I'm still stuck with a, cop a few copies of the Jeff Leopard record. <sighs> yeah, it's not all Guns N' Roses, kids. Sometimes releasing a record is pain. It's pain. It really is. But it had to be done. You know? People needed to experience the glories of sheet metal. So yeah, you know, anti-scenes touring all over the place... Um, that was in November of 1992 when the Jeff Leopard record came out. 
And, uh, wow. They played Hoboken, New Jersey on November 1st, 1992. Two days before the release of the Jeff Leppard record. And that was the night at Maxwell's that the original intro was recorded for Eat More Possum. The MC for the show that night at Maxwell's on November 1st, 1992 was the Cosmic Commander of Wrestling. He came all the way up from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the hostile city, PA, to MC the show in Hoboken. And I'd never met Cosmo before. Um, you know, and I'm, of course a lifelong and huge professional wrestling fan. You want to see me get going, let's talk about wrestling, specifically territory wrestling from the 70s, and most specifically, championship wrestling from Florida, motherfucker. CWF. NWA CWF. You know what I'm talking about, and if you don't, you better find out. Anyway, the Cosmic Commander of Wrestling was the MC for this anti-scene show. And even though I'm a gigantic mark for professional wrestling, I was like, who the hell is this guy? Because he was obnoxious. He had that whole South Philly thing down, man. He was like, he wanted to piss people off. And I think if there had been more people there at Maxwell's that night, they might have tried to string him up from a lamppost. He was really getting them going. But anyway, somebody was rolling tape that night. They recorded the whole thing, and it was his spiel from that night at Maxwell's that ended up being the intro on the first pressings of Eat More Possum. And I'm going to talk about Eat More Possum at length on my next history lesson. So how's that for a little bit of a teaser? Not a spoiler, but a teaser. So, yep, Annie seems back out touring all over the place. The Jeff Leopard record is out. Eat More Possum is waiting in the wings. They are sowing the seeds of destructo discontent everywhere they go. It is happening, baby. It is happening. Man. Which leads us to the next phase of operations. The next time I got a phone call from Jeff Clayton. Jeff Clayton was always on the phone. And you'll notice that I was always picking it up. Pretty good symbiotic relationship going on there. Jeff Clayton called me up one day and said, Man, I got a record that I think should be released. I just participated in the recording of an album, or I should say a record by this guy named Mad Brother Ward. He's a Charlotte dude. He's got the whole wrestling thing down. He's really good. Um, I play bass on it. Sorry, guys. I don't think I was supposed to let that slip. You didn't hear me say that Jeff Clayton played bass on the Mad Brother Ward record. It's actually a guy named... Uh, it's a guy named Leech. Leech. It was Leech. Just expunge my previous comments, okay? So he called me up and said, Yeah, man, I got this guy, Mad Brother Ward. We recorded a record. It's really good. Greg plays drums on it. You want to put it out? I said, Yes! Yes, it's the 90s. I'm swimming in money. Swimming in it. I'm drowning in it. I don't know what to do. I gotta do something to spend all this money I'm making. Let's put out a Mad Brother Ward record. I never heard of the guy. Who cares? Let's do it. You say it's good? It's good. You didn't play bass on it? All the better. Let's make it happen. Your brother's on it? Dude, Clayton rhythm section? We're gonna make it happen. So that set the stage for Mad Brother Ward and the Screaming Street Trash, hated by all. And you can see where the web of interconnections comes into play. And you're seeing just how spread out the anti-scene family really is. And Jeff talked about this in his last broadcast, maybe even the one before that, that anti-scene functions best as a family, as a circle, as a bunch of people who know and understand each other, as people who are on the same page with each other. And this is evidence, if not downright proof. Mad Brother Ward, who you all know, look at him right there. Look at that fine looking heel with the championship belt. Mad Brother Ward, the current 
guitar player for the Almighty Anti Scene, and Greg Clayton, past drummer, and if the occasion calls for it, could still be drummer of Anti Scene, you know, depending on the project or the circumstance. So you've got half of various versions of Anti Scene right there on this Mad Brother Ward and the Screaming Street Trash record. This is a damn good record, man. I like this record an awful lot. I like them all. I like this one, too. So we released this one. This came out on January 21st of 1993. Grunge rock and alt rock haven't even peaked yet. This record we did 500 of, and it sold pretty quickly. People really popped for this one. This is a really good record. Lots of professional wrestling themology on this one. The aforementioned first day of issue stamp. For all you stamp collectors out there, keeping the science of philately alive and well. That's right there. Black vinyl. Awesome. Kicks ass. And that coincides with Anti-Scene in January of 93. I guess getting ready to go to Europe. I don't have a date for their, uh, for their European tour. But they had gotten back from the Northeast and were definitely gearing up to go to Europe. So there's a lot of stuff happening. I'm going to mention, too, this is kind of a... A teaser also when I was uh, down in Charlotte for anti-scene duty I was visiting Mad Brother Ward and he said that he had all of these on hand unused sleeves for the Mad Brother Ward and the screaming screaming street trash 7 inch lots of unused sleeves because you know getting back to what I was saying before when you did these kinds of things back in the day Everything was done by hand. It was either hand-drawn, everything was cut to form and pasted. And when you went to the print shop, they would run them off, and there was, you know, usually an overrun of some sort. And they had a great big overrun on these. So Mad Brother Ward saved all the sleeves, and he said, Man, I don't know what to do with these things. You want them? The wheels began to turn. The craven look came into my eye, and I said, Mad Brother Ward... I got an idea. I think I know what we can do with these unused sleeves. These original 1993 bona fide old school sleeves. I have an idea of something that we can use to fill these with. And he said, all right, if you really want to. I said, I really want to. So keep an eye open, kids. Something is going to be happening with these unused original Mad Brother Ward and the Screaming Street Trash Hated by All Record Sleeves. There's not going to be very many of them, and it's going to be really cool. You heard it here first. So time marches on. It's still 1993. And alt-rock and alternative rock and grunge and grunge rock are still very much alive. And anti-scene is riding the crest of the wave. They're having records put out by Sub Pop. They're having records put out by Amphetamine Reptile. They're having records put out by Ajax. They're having records put out by Steel Cage. The time is right. There was a flood of anti-scene releases in the 90s. All killer, no filler. Great stuff. And it was time for TPOS to re-enter the vinyl fray with anti-scene. And to take their, that's my, rightful place in the pantheon of anti-scene early 90s releases. Got the phone call from Jeff Clayton! Man, this is becoming a recurring theme, isn't it? I gotta lube up a little bit here. I love that Danbury mineral, mineral water. Feels good. I had mentioned that um, anti-scene had toured Europe. Uh, they had been there over there in 1992, and Clayton said, I got this really awesome tape of us live in Nuremberg, Germany. I want you to put out a couple of songs from it, and I also want you to release a couple of songs by Blue Green Gods. We're going to do a split seven-inch, anti-scene and Blue Green Gods. Now, y'all might have heard me talk about Todd Goss earlier, the erstwhile anti-scene sound man who was on tour with them and ran sound and made sure they sounded good every single night, Todd Gost had a band of his own called Blue Green Gods. Sound nothing like anti-scene. Blue Green Gods were downright weird. And I love downright weird. Noisy as hell. 
coming from a whole other dimension. Got to see them a few times, because for a while there was this sort of Danbury, North Carolina axis of musical evil. Bands were traveling up and down the 95 corridor. Bands from Danbury would go to North Carolina. Bands from North Carolina would go to Danbury. We were totally cross-pollinating each other's cultural flowers. So Blue Green Gods played in Danbury a couple of times. Loved them. Thought they were great. So I was like, yes. An anti-scene Blue Green Gods split 7-inch. I'm down. So that is how the infamous Brown Bag record came about. The anti-scene Blue Green God split 7-inch. Excuse me. This came out one month after the Mad Brother Ward record. And this and the Mad Brother Ward came out, whatever it was, several months after the Rawhead record. That's how fast and furious things were happening in the early 90s. The fact that anti seemed to be on the road pretty much nonstop and have this flurry of releases coming out, just like one after another. And you know, I think in a lot of ways, this is the foundation that anti-scene was built on that the band rests on to this day, was all this intense, no-nonsense activity in the 90s. That was an awesome and most excellent springboard with which to propel oneself. And the band is still at it to this day. I talk to people now who discovered anti-scene during this time period in the early 90s. The band never quit. They never stopped. Lineup changes didn't matter. Label changes didn't matter. They never stopped. And they kept releasing records. So this one, we were really feeling our oats. We said, we're going to go for a thousand on this one. We're going to do a thousand anti-scene blue green gods split seven inches. And... I, I just had this idea of doing it in a brown paper bag because at the time, and I showed you this earlier on the Bad Brother Ward single, the de rigueur for doing a sleeve was the 7x14 single or double sided fold over that you stick in a plastic bag and stick the record in. I didn't want to do that, and Clayton talked about that with the first anti-scene records. He didn't want that aesthetic. He didn't want a folded piece of paper in a plastic bag. He wanted a sleeve, like the kind you would see on a, on a Men at Work record, or a, a Flock of Seagulls record, or a Devo record, or a Duran Duran record that you would buy at Record Bar, or Specs, or Peaches, or whatever. Wanted that. I love the idea of doing it in a bag, and originally my idea was to print it in a bag and just cut it to size. And there you would have your low budget one piece sleeve. But when they came back from the printers, the design was a little bit off. Like if it had been printed on the very bottom, we could have cut it on the top and had that style of one piece sleeve, but it didn't quite work. So I was like, screw it. Let's just leave them as is. Put them in bags. And I think it looks pretty damn good. We did 500 on clear, 500 on black. So there's equal numbers of each. No, no one is rarer than the other. The original idea was to have the label art be the immortal Cactus Jack on one side and the equally, if not more immortal, Ric Flair on the other side. But the pressing plant refused to use this label artwork because they were afraid of copyright issues. They didn't want to get sued by anybody. So they wouldn't use the label artwork. So what I ended up having to do was press it with blank labels and then a separate sheet with the label artwork and my own little rant, which is uh, as follows. Hey, the junior heavyweights at the pressing plant were too chicken livered to press this beautiful record with these fantastic labels. So here they are. Put them on the records yourself. Like we should have done it for you anyway. Damn right. You gotta work for your Destructo Rock. So that was it. A thousand of them. Now here's where the story, as it so often does, gets interesting. When the printer was making those paper bag records, the bags kept getting jammed up in the press. And so they ended up with about 200 that were spoiled. And... Uh, it didn't make any economic sense to order another 
like whatever thousand bags just to print 200. So I thought, well, what can we do to compromise? How about if we print them on plain white envelopes? We can do that, right? Because I was able to buy small quantities of plain white envelopes. And back in those days, when everything was done with ink on an aluminum sheet press, the print shop I used had what they called the free color day. Every day of the week, you get a free color of ink because full color printing was extremely expensive. Black on white was the most efficacious. These guys gave you one free color on a given day of the week, and that was a pretty big deal. I took advantage of that as much as I possibly could, which is why the Jeff Leopard sleeve was printed red on white. Free red ink. Got to take advantage of that. So the color of the day on Thursday was brown. So I printed 200 of these on brown to sort of tie in with the brown paper bag theme. And that's why these exist. And by the time I made these, sales had kind of leveled off. Like I'd already sold the 800 brown paper bag sleeves. But by the time these came on the market, you know, the release had kind of played out. So the, the, the white sleeves just pretty much went straight into storage. They never really got on the market too much until same deal. Years later, I was unpacking a bunch of stuff and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I got these. So I dragged them out and started selling them. And I still have a few left, just saying. And I never know. Oh, look at that one. This one's clear. I don't know what they are. Like I, I stuck the records in the sleeves and didn't mark what they were. So some are black, some are clear. Doesn't matter. There's a hundred in black and a hundred in clear in these sleeves. Equal numbers, potluck, take your chance. If you want one, contact me directly. I got them. And that leads to the final anomaly in the anti-scene Blue Green Gods saga, which is the fabled hard tile edition. This is something that nobody knows about. And this also underlines one of my key bugaboos with releasing records. It's like, no matter how hard you try, nothing ever adds up. It really doesn't. Like, you go to the pressing plant, you say you want a thousand, they'll either send you 980, or they'll send you a thousand and twenty. Okay. You get sleeves printed, you say you want a thousand, they'll either send you 900, or they'll send you 1,400. There's always an overrun. There's always an underrun. Nothing ever adds up. So you always end up with spare sleeves, or in the case of this, spare records. Even after making the extra envelope sleeves, I still had 10 records left sitting around with no sleeves, no more envelopes, no more bags, no more nothing. Just 10 records sitting around. And I hate to see things go to waste. I really do. I'm very efficient that way. I will not let one scrap of anything go to waste. So I was sitting in the fabled back room of Trash American Style saying, what am I going to do with these records? And for some reason, for some odd reason, I had this great big stack of tiles in the back room. I don't even know what they were for. I didn't know what they were for then. I don't know what they're for now. But they were sitting there and I looked at them and I counted them up and I had 20 of them. And they were almost exactly record sleeve size. Well, ding, ding, ding. All of a sudden, I know what to do with 10 records and 20 tiles. I took my office copy machine I took 40 sheets of sticker paper, I ran off front covers, I ran off back covers, I got some packing tape, stuck them together, put the records in the middle, sealed them with the bag sealing machine I had to get because I had people in prison, I had prisoners who would try to order cassettes. You could only send a cassette to a prison if it was sealed. So I got a plastic sealing machine so I could seal these things up. And I applied the plastic bag sealer to the tiles and made 10 
of the extremely elusive, if not illusive, tile version of the anti-scene Blue Green Gods split 7-inch. And promptly forgot about them. <laughs> Stuck them on a shelf and nobody ever saw them <laughs> until years later. And now I'm showing everybody out there this. So John Adam and all you John Adams out there yearn for this. Why don't you? And when that record came out in J uh, February of 93, I see right around the anti scene were playing Atlanta, Georgia, which means they were either playing spot shows or doing a tour of the Southeast. And it was still exciting and it was still happening. Yeah, 19 times. And I saw them five times at least during that era. Always a fan. Always. Would go out of my way to see Anti Scene, even to Hoboken, New Jersey. Well worth it every time. And that, my friends, brings us to the almost conclusion of this week's history lesson. We've gone up to 1993. Next week, we're going to talk about Eat More Possum and the Carolina Shit Kickers. Two releases which merit an entire history lesson of their own. But before I sign off, I want to, as always, well, I'll get to that in a second. I want to do my usual two plugs at the end. Two plugs. Plug number one relates to the fact that anti-scene are very much alive, very well. We hope you guys are too. We've got a lot of action planned for the immediate future once situation gets to be a little bit less weird. We're going to be out there playing. We want to play everywhere. And I want to reiterate that we are very into, to use the current parlance, crowdsourcing our gigs. Yes, we love booking agents. Yes, we love clubs. But we want, we want to work with you, the fan and the self-starter, the bootstrapper. We want to work directly with you. If you want anti-scene to play in your local venue, VFW hall, living room, whatever, we'll entertain the notion. All you got to do is reach out and contact us. I'm on the booking committee. Reach out to Anti-Scene via the Anti-Scene Facebook page, or me personally, if you want that special thrill of talking to Malcolm 10 online, and we'll talk. As I said before, and I'll say again, Anti-Scene is not a cheap date. We do need money. We need money to play, but we give value for money. And it's quite possible that we might be more affordable than you think we are. So reach out and touch Anti-Scene with an offer to play because we want to do it. We want to play for you people. We want to do it as much as we possibly can, wherever we possibly can. Australia, let's do it. New Zealand, come on, get us on board. Make it happen. Let's go back to Japan. Let's go to Europe. Put some good offers on the table. Mind you, I said good offers. And we will entertain them. All right? That's that. The second plug. A lot of people popped for this last week, and I got to mention it again. The Malcolm Tent solo album, which features exclusive, unreleased, live anti-scene track. A super red-hot version of Sabu, featuring the current lineup. See, I'm the bass player. That's why it's on my career retrospective album. It's on here if you want it. It's available. It's on exciting colored vinyl. It's got a fourth grade picture of me in the upper left hand corner. And it's got anti scene. It's got they hate us. It's got me playing with the drummer of Devo. It's got all kinds of great stuff. It's here. It's available. It's happening. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and letting me yammer on and on and on. It means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the history lessons. I hope you like them as much as I have enjoyed being a part of it and being allowed to be on the anti-scene death train. Absolute thrill and an honor. And it's really great to be here for all you people. 
Jeff Clayton's going to be on the air next on Tuesday with his history lesson. I'm going to be on social media pretty much constantly. So stop by and say hey. I'll be back in about 166 hours time. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.